，女士们、先生们，我们的飞机已经抵达北京首都国际机场。Welcome to the stage. Let's welcome our six international guest artists. Welcome to the stage on CGTN. I'm the host Julian Wagen. Welcome to the first edition of the International Young Artist Salon. I'd like to first of all thank all of our guests on the panel today for bringing forth the diverse musical cultures and traditions from the East and West and around the world to this global event. Why don't we give a warm and big round of applause to our guests on the panel today? All right, let's take a seat. I was really surprised, pleasantly surprised to see how well you guys played off of each other.、Um, given that this is the first time most of you have played with each other in person, did you have any surprises playing and putting this performance together in such a short period of time? This time, I met new people and different artists, different instruments, and I think give me a lot of new idea.、Oh. It's really cool, and I think only for just now, and we're ready. Be really good friends、uh, because、yeah. this is the magic from music. I think, right? Yeah, I think the same.、But、generally, it brings us together in a way. We don't really talk. We didn't talk that much. We talk music a lot. I'm really surprised by the the plethora of instruments that we brought together here today. Yes.、Um, how they, you know, they're from different countries, different places, old and new. But they sound. They can play off of each other so well. They can jam with each other so well. It resonated with、uh, with us today. Strike a chord, literally.、Uh, why don't we start off by having each and every one of you tell us about an instrument from your own culture or upbringing? I'm playing violin. I studied in China, and then I got to know a lot of about Chinese instruments as well when I was studying.、Um, Uh, at the Conservatory of Music, so I got to find out that actually a lot of Chinese traditional instruments are very similar to Armenian instruments. And for example, when I was studying, I didn't know that sona. A lot of people were thinking that, oh, maybe you never heard sona in your life, and they were like, oh, you're going to be so surprised to hear the music. And I heard, I'm like, I know it. And they're like, how come? I was like, my country has the same instrument too. And then it took me. To realizing the identities of people and human cultures are so connected, and you can find out through culture and through music. That's why, even though you never hear any Chinese instrument, when I hear the guzheng for the first time, I feel something. I cannot explain. Some some kind of connection. It's like I know this this sound, this quality, this kind of、uh, vibration, long time. So I think yes,、um, like now I play kalangu. Kalangu is really similar with.、Uh, Uh, of course, 
the sound is different, but the foundation is like a uh, Chinese big drum, the Marshall Drum of Dago. Same principle. Kalangu. Yeah, Kalangu. Number you just did. Was it was for like uh, I would say maybe calm. It's a zuga. Okay. Or kenema. I say kenema. So I'm really talking. It's the same as Chinese music as well. When I was listening to what Simon just did, it made me think of the bendings on the guzheng yeah. strings. Mm. And it's also Absolutely. a way of speaking because each region has its own way of speaking. Absolutely. It's related to their local dialect. So that's why the bending from Henan province would be different from Shandong province yes. because it's related to their local language. language. And that's just the same as the same. talking drum. And Nicola, you certainly felt the the calling from the Suona as well, right? You've always wanted to write for the Suona. Yeah, yes, I haven't had the chance yet. I think a Suona is maybe more of an acquired taste for, for some people, yeah. like, uh, you know, sort of a, a French cheese or a chou dofu, you know, maybe <laughs> not, not something that, that necessarily translates, to, um, but as a, you know, an instrument with an extremely strong personality and a sort of outdoor use and its um, dual nature as a, you know, as a funeral and wedding instrument and all these things about it, I think are very interesting. And it, it just besides the, that it can technically do very interesting things. It's interesting where we, how we associate instruments with home, with a particular region, but it's really enlightening to see after this discussion how the roots of all these different instruments are actually all once very much connected and also how well they can resonate with each other for something as unexpected as a suona and saxophone. Check this out. <laughs> here hail from different parts of the world or have traveled the world, right? How were you changed each by your discovery of Chinese culture? I was uh, living a quite fast-paced life in, in the States and when I came here I started to study Guqin and, uh, and it pushed me to slow down. And as I traveled around China and got to learn about different musics from different cultures, uh, I also got to learn more about the way that time is perceived. Uh, maybe when I was out in, in Xinjiang and uh, studying the Uyghur Mukam, right, I learned about how the music can be a time for you to reflect on the love of family and the love of people. And this was a very different uh, way of thinking about why I'm making music. And before I was thinking about music as a, as a way to, to, to show my expression to the world, then I was... Uh, humbled to, to learn a new language, a musical language. Uh, Lucy, what about for you? The guzhou was given by my grandpa. And another thing he taught me when I was very little was Chinese poems. And the first poem he taught me was Jing Ye Si Bai Li Bai, Chuang Qian Ming Yue Guang, Yi Si Di Shang Shuang, Ju Tou Wang Ming Yue, Di Tou Si Gu Xiang. Until one night I was in America, I was so lonely, and I just had my guzheng in my room. And that was the time I remembered this poem. 
I was literally tearing when I was remembering the poem, and I think that was the thing related to me. You know, Chinese music, Chinese culture, Chinese literature. I feel the people during Song Dynasty or Tang Dynasty felt the same thing as what we feel right now. You know, depression, sadness, happiness. We are the same. In fact, poetry and music were always very much interwoven in Chinese history, and certainly in other histories around the world. I, re I remember in the Han Dynasty, this was when the Imperial Music Bureau was established to collect songs, folk songs, um, as well as poetry uh, from local regions. And uh, it's just incredible to see how this tradition has, you know, actually survived through something as, uh, you know, as new as the works of Niccolo, because you've actually composed for the Shijing. Which is consists of um, the you know the Book of Odes. It consists of a collection of songs. You know the Shijing is uh, some of the oldest Chinese literature. Really, one of the foundational things from even before the before the Qin Dynasty, from around the time of Confucius. It's even much more difficult than Tang poetry because it's so it's so old, and uh, the language has changed so much since then. But anyway, I ended up picking three three poems and basing this piece on it. And um, I think it's, of all the sort of cross-cultural things I've attempted, I think it was one of the most successful. When, when, the, when the piece was premiered in Beijing, I felt like the audience really resonated with what I'd said, and I was very happy with the, with the performance. So. We know the power of poetry. And for music, it's almost as though when poetry doesn't do justice to what, how you feel, then there's the music that comes to the rescue. Let's talk more about this in terms of um, the characteristics of, of music from each country. Doesn't matter what the composers of each country is, they composed, but they always inputted some traditional elements in it. Now, when I even when we talk about Chinese very classic violin concerto, Butterfly Lovers, when you hear it, said just like you imagine yourself sitting somewhere in I don't know in a Chinese environment and enjoying all this uh, lake and then you know having some tea and stuff. And the same with Armenian music. Uh, let's say one of the composers, Hacha Durian, when he wrote the violin concerto. It's a Western play by violin, right? But then it's so Armenian. When you hear, you hear yourself probably with the surrounded by Armenian men dancing around you, and then those beautiful women with clothes. So what I'm thinking is like similarities between those cultures is that we carry the identity for other generations. We don't compose for general public. We compose for general public with showing our authenticity which helps us to carry these cultures for so long. That was beautiful. Jashin, do you think music has an identity? I totally can remember when I was in middle school. It's my first time playing outside and not in China. And I chose one piece about Chopin and another piece about Chinese piece. Uh, Shan Dan Dan Kai Hua Hong Yan Yan. So it's my first time playing these two different music in outside. And I cannot understand like why people after I play the Chinese piece, they stand up and give me really big pop. So in that moment, I feel really get the touch feeling. And so from that moment, I really think I need to play more about Chinese music. So when I came back, I did a lot of um, crossover. Like I can play with our who and play with jazz people. And so I, I think culture really can do exchange and can combine together. Beautiful, beautiful. Let's try to find it through your Gujang piece, which you've been uh, made by Sun Nung. You, it's, I've seen a piece of that, a snippet of that. Tell us more about, about it. Oh, well, this is the thing I've been doing for decades, actually. I've collaborated with jazz musicians, with rock and roll musicians, with uh, world music musicians. The moment when I met Simon, we actually, the first time we met, we improvised for three hours. We didn't even have dinner. We just played and played and played and voila. Well, let's take a <laughs> listen.
beautiful. Niccolo, uh, we've seen a lot of Chinese influences on Western music composition. For instance, Puccini's Turando, uh, John Cage's Music of Changes, as well as Mahler's Das Lied von der Erde. What are some international influences on Chinese music? Well, I think the reason that we spend time often discussing the former is because the, the latter are so numerous and, um, you know, inescapable that it's almost uh, it just goes beneath notice. I mean, there's a symphony orchestra in every major, you know, Chinese city. When you, when you, you know, go to KTV and pick a Chinese song, you know, uh, I think 99 times out of 100, it'll have cho the chords of Western music backing it up. So, um, I mean, I think, you know, whether or not adding harmony to a Chinese folk song is, is a good idea, is an aesthetic question, and I think that, for me, it just depends on how it's done. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think um, equal temperament, I mean, influencing Chinese instruments, for example, the, you know, the sheng, uh, the, you know, the mouth organ, just since the 80s, since it's just, you know, become a sort of conservatory major, this instrument has been modified to be able to basically play the same notes as a piano. Sort of a little bit like, you know, they were talking about the saxophone and the sona, the difference with the keys and how the keys of the saxophone sort of, again, lock it into this Western scale. And now, in Western music, there's the concept of harmony, right? Are these two similar and different for you, Lucy? Uh, well, the Chinese music has a different way of harmonizing, which is called zhi sheng fu diao. For example, as we talked about before, for the Western music, it's the chords, like the root, the third, the fifth. But we don't have this structure. We have another way to play with each other, which means we have the same main melody, but we would go around with it. So I would add a few notes here. You would add a few notes there. He would cut off some notes there. But together, we can play very well with, with each other. And to me, I think that's the concept of Confucius, don't you think? We are harmonizing together, but we are not exactly the same. Yeah, but uh, just as, as Lucy described, it's... I mean, it's, for example, if you think of Peking Opera, you know, what the singers and what the, you know, the band is doing are basically the same, but not completely. And maybe I think the, usually the instruments play more notes, and the singer is sort of just following the outline of their, their melodic line. And I think that's the reason why we're talking about this universal notion of harmony that goes beyond just the notes, right? Um, for instance, between man and nature, I know in Africa, music can serve more than just, you know, one function. Like I was saying, it's, a, it's a sm mo something that is more uh, related to uh, healing the body, the soul, some sound that we put together to solve this kind of problem. Some sound that we use, this song and that song, different voice to solve this kind of problem. So it's uh, something that it's more spiritual for us. We have uh, some rhythm in my country that before you cannot even let the kids listen to those rhythm. Some rhythm that was only for women. Like uh, one dance in my tribe, we call this uh, dance Bikutsi. It means the rhythm of hitting the floor. And at the time, women will be dancing or singing only at night when it's a full moon. When I look at the poems that I pick among Chinese poetry to, that resonate with me to set, I mean, a lot of the Tang poetry, you know, are, are about friendship, you know, especially like friendship between guys. Um, and none of those poems ever like scream out to me for the, to, to be used. But, but the one I, one I recently wrote uh, uh, for Shenyang was just about someone in the mountains staying up not the night in a temple and getting up the next morning. It's called the Shanshi. It's also one of the, you know, from the 300 by Han Yu. Um, and it's about just, you know, walking in the, in, the, in the forest and washing your feet in the stream. And um, somehow those are the things that really attract me to try and portray in my music. What about sort of washing drama. your feet in the streams that attracted you? I'm curious. I don't know. It just sounds lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, the very last line of the poem is really what, what, what attracted me to it, where he, he's, you know, asking his friends, like, what if I just stayed here and never came back? you know, never came back. And that was, I don't know, that's sort of, obviously, he's not going to really do that, right? But the, the sort of that dream of looking at the distant mountain and just uh, wanting to get lost and escape. Recently, I've written a, uh, one for string quartet based on a Sichuanese folk song that was recommended to me by the violist of this uh, quartet you will see in a few minutes. When I listen to the song, you hear the flowers bloom one after another, and it, you know that this is sort of like, you know, a correlation to her feelings and anticipation thinking that this is the day that her lover finally arrives. Now, let's take a listen. Let's give it up for the Mellow String Quartet with an adaptation of a Citroen folk song.
That was beautiful, the Mila String Quartet. And a lot of people see, interestingly, technology crossover and uh, AI as tools or instruments to achieve this sort of permanence and uh, the full potentials of music. For you, do you see technology media as an extension of your instrument, of your body? Yeah, for me, technology like this is a tool. In the same way that a camera, uh, when it first came about, wowed the world with this ability to take a perfect image of the thing in front of it. Uh, but just because a camera can take a really good image doesn't make it a beautiful image. And it takes a photographer who has studied art and understands color and shapes and space to make a beautiful image with a camera. And for me, that's what AI is. It's, it's a tool, and yeah, it can do really cool things right now. What about distinguish between a piece of music music written by AI and one by a human being, Astrid. Beethoven himself said it's a lot of calculation in it. They know exactly what notes to hit. Sorry, I'm revealing the secret. You know, sometimes when there are some um, uh, notes that say are some tunes that it makes you sad, makes you angry, it's, it's a pure calculation actually. Composing is a calculation plus, of course, it's the human nature in it. But then AI is actually doing the same thing. It's calculating how to put the melody together. And at the end, we all work for making somebody feel something. And if it's going to be AI doing it, but if they can put together something simple that will change an emotion in somebody simple, I don't disagree with that idea. So I think it both can work cooperatively together. AR can compose their own, human can compose together. They also can compose together, human and AR together. I think. Yes, um, AI can create a lot of things, like we're saying, but uh, it's still a tool, a tool for me, something that we can use to do things. Because, first of all, AI is a kind of accumulation of information of what people give to him. This is number one. I think um, we still have something that is really unique. The power of imagination is something that really distinct humankind with uh, other things in this uh, dimension. And it's not something that just take calculation. I mean, to play I mean, devil's advocate, I, I, I want to believe you so badly and, and the other people who have expressed similar yeah. <laughs> sentiments. But I, you know, some, I mean, what is machine learning other than the universal archive in a way? I mean, what is ChatGPT doing? I mean, it has access to this huge body of written, the written word, which is, you know, the universal archive in a way. And it's, and it's learning maybe in the, it's not so different than the way that a child would, you know. So, I don't know. I, I deeply hope that, that you're right. It seems to me that, you know, the, the core of this discussion, where we're, you, were, you were touching up on these two ideas, which is creativity and imagination. Now, are these determined by the extent to which humans can create and imagine? Is it, in the way it distinguishes between human imagination and artificial intelligence imagination, is it the extent to which it can be randomized? I think he's receiving what we give to him because it's a collection of what we give and it creates a process of information that we give. It's what I think. Because he cannot have what we didn't give to him. And I feel another thing which is missing in those AI calculating thing is mistakes. Because sometimes musicians make mistakes and those mistakes are the beautiful parts. Well, I'd invite you to come to a music technology concert because <laughs> we have plenty of mistakes. Our, our whole day don't is come mistakes. To music. <laughs> we don't um, make mistakes. But <laughs> some of those mistakes end up giving us ideas, and that's the, for me the beauty of of these weird weird clashes or quirks is because they give you an idea that you didn't plan for, and from those ideas you can make something that you never thought about. Okay, well, why don't we go and find out through Jacob's demonstration? Mm. All right, let's take a look. <laughs> Thank you. 
we were marveling at these uh, videos on the screens, Jacob. Just have a question: Are the videos do they correspond to or respond to how you play? Mm, yes. Uh, well, there's there's interaction, I think, but going both ways uh, when when we're doing it. And in fact, uh, speaking about our topic on AI, uh, all of the flowers that we just saw were uh -huh. uh, generated by AI. And so that's what interests me. I think that the things that come out of AI, uh, maybe by themselves, are not so interesting. But but what we can do with them, and uh, and visual art, and um, well, in chess, and in, in in Chinese uh, idea of the four arts. But I take that more as logic. And so that's where I bring in multimedia, because it has visual arts, it has logic. Uh, we just have a different perception and different way of expressing the music because uh, music itself is something that, as we say, it's something that is in us already. But according to my culture, maybe I will take it to th in this angle and these people will take it in this angle. That's why we can see that actually uh, um, most things are similar. So maybe going back to what we were talking about harmony earlier, uh, that's, that's something that I found in Kuchin music, is that there's this requirement of, of being uh, harmony in yourself as an artist, not just with music, if you're a Kuchin player, but also with poetry, which we've talked about tonight. With the different cultures, we're only seeing music from different lenses. Music is obviously an incredible repository of humanity's cultural heritage, and as we can see here today, real preservation means tapping into the abundance that is hidden within music and to unravel the strength and the wisdom of our forefathers for the future. Whether it's through AI, technology, or crossovers, or the kind of experimentations and collaborations of old and new between East and West and artists around the world, our heritage is being not only preserved, but also evolving towards a common language of tomorrow. I'm Julian Walken for The Stage on CGTN. Bye for now.